Hi, I'm Pete McCall, the author of the A-certified article on blood flow restriction training. To help you understand a little bit more about blood flow restriction, about the benefits, and about how to use it possibly with your clients, I'm going to include two interviews here, or two segments interviews that I did for my All About Fitness podcast. The first segment of the interview is going to be with Dr. Jeremy Lenicky. Dr. Lenicky is a leading researcher. He's a professor of exercise physiology at the University of Mississippi. And when I was writing the article, study after study after study, Dr. Lenicky was a contributing author or lead author of those studies. He's one of the leading experts right now on research on the topic of blood flow restriction training. So in order to understand a little bit more about it, I went straight to the source. So the first person you're going to hear from is with Dr. Lenicky talking about some of the science behind blood flow restriction training. The second person you're going to hear is Dr. Jim Stray Gunderson. Dr. Stray Gunderson is a medical doctor and an exercise physiologist. He's been working with members of the U.S. Olympic Training Program for a number of years, and he's a practitioner who uses blood flow restriction training with his athletes and his regular clients. He's going to talk about the benefits of BFR and about how he uses that in his practice. I want to give you some extra insights about blood flow restriction training. You're going to, because of the research on the topic, because new products are coming out all the time to use for blood flow restriction training, we want to be able to give you the information that you can learn about it so you can decide whether or not it's right for your clients and the people that you work with in your practice. So let's get started. The first person you're going to hear is Dr. Jeremy Lenicky from the University of Mississippi. The second person you're going to hear is Dr. Jim Stray Gunnerson, an exercise physiologist out of Utah. Yeah, so blood flow restriction is essentially placing a cuff or a wrap. Um, so kind of a, a modified blood pressure cuff um, or even a blood pressure cuff at the top of the limb, so the arm or the leg. Um, and essentially, you just inflate it to a pressure that partially restricts blood flow. So blood flow is always going into the limb during exercise. Um, but when that's done and it's combined with low load exercise, so 20 or 30 percent of your max, um, the observations that we typically see are changes in muscle size and strength. So it's just uh, exercising with partial blood flow restriction for short periods of time, right? We're not applying blood flow restriction for hours, it's for minutes. Um, so it's very acute uh, application. Um, I got into blood flow restriction uh, when I was, I did an internship at the University of Illinois uh, towards the end of my undergraduate. So at that time, I was starting to get more and more interested in actually doing research. Um, and as an undergraduate, when you're reading research papers, there's a lot of times where you, you, you just, don't know what's going on because there's just things that are more advanced than what you're capable of understanding at that time. So I, I read a paper on blood flow restriction um, and I just remember being, that, that doesn't make any sense. I, I must just not understand what I'm reading because it doesn't make any sense that you would restrict blood flow and good things would happen. So I was like, I, I just must not be understanding. So I went to Illinois um, and I was interning in a lab up there doing some animal work, muscle physiology work up there. And some of the guys in the gym that I was training at, who I had known from the bodybuilding.com message board, so kind of a community back in the day, um, they were kind of messing around with this idea of blood flow restriction, uh, just using some different uh, uh, knee wraps and things like that. Um, and I, I was talking to them and I remember thinking, well, maybe I, maybe I was reading that correctly. So then I just started reading about it every day. Um, and I, I came back to Southeast Missouri State for my master's. Um, and I wrote a, a review paper with uh, my mentor there, Dr. Fugel, um, just about how we might be able to use kind of elastic knee wraps to, to induce this thing. It was just an idea. Um, and that's basically what I've been doing mostly ever since. And that's interesting. The first time I'd heard about it was maybe mid 2000s, so probably about the same time. Yeah. Um, somebody I knew in the, in the educator in the education side of things um, was was telling me about using blood pressure cuffs to to, to help help uh, with hypertrophy. And like you, it like was like, huh? What? Yeah. You know, you're kind of like you hear that, and it seems so counterintuitive. And then when you start talking about occluding blood flow or stopping blood flow and exercise, I'm like, that seems way 
over the, the, the scope of what personal trainers, what a normal personal trainer would do. And that's why I've spent the last number of years is in educating personal trainers. So it was one of those things where I heard about, I kind of filed it away as at some point I'll kind of dig at that a little bit more, but it seems to be coming back into trend. I mean, you've published a, num a bunch of research over the last number of years. What's been your most interesting finding? What's the thing that's really caused you to go, wow, I didn't realize that this would happen? Um, several things, I would say. I think when I went into it, um, there was a, there, there's, a, there's several different ways to restrict blood flow. Um, and there was one way that was the, the more popular way, uh, more traditional view. And I, I, I went into it thinking that that was probably the end all be all, the only way that it should be done. Um, and, you know, some of our early work pretty quickly suggested that probably wasn't the case. Um, that, you know, assuming that you're applying appropriate stimulus, it really probably matters less about what particular cuff that you're using. Um, it's more about the technique itself. It's not saying that different ones don't have, you know, good features or anything like that. But, you know, it, I, I just went into it thinking that the only way you can do it is if you use this. And I, I, I don't think that's the case. Um, I think another one is we started getting into this idea of saying, you know, we need to be applying the pressure relative because the, the old studies, they applied the same pressure to everyone. Mm. So, um, we did a lot of work on that. And, you know, my original thought was, you know, that that would really dictate, um, a lot of the muscle adaptation. If, if you apply the wrong pressure, maybe you wouldn't get the same stimulus. Um, and there's been some caveats added to that idea now because we've done enough work where it suggests that um, the, the pressure applied, the relative pressure, so if I apply 90% um, of the pressure it takes to completely cut off your blood flow versus 40%, the muscle adaptations, in other words, muscle size, muscle strength changes, those are probably going to be pretty similar no matter the pressure. Uh, but the vascular adaptation, so changes in resting blood flow, some of these indirect markers of capillarity, they may actually require a higher pressure. So um, there's also some safety con uh, considerations that you have to think about with the pressure applied. Um, but I think those are, are some of the bigger ones. And I think more recently, and this is, I'll, I'll just be up front and say quite controversial because it's not, it's not specific to blood flow restriction. It's, it's resistance training in general. Um, a lot of our work on blood flow restriction and a lot of our work on low loads has started to make us wonder whether or not that change in muscle size that we see with exercise is actually contributing to changes in strength or if there may be two different things when we're increasing. So that last one is specific to all exercise, not just blood flow restriction, but it's certainly a, a controversial take, I would say. Well, and I want to stay on this for a second before I, I got, want to ask a question about that, about size versus strength. But looking at this from a safety standpoint, I think the one thing I read in, in two or three papers was as long as you have a pulse, a distal, further away from the occlusion point from where the band is applied, as long as you have a pulse distal to that, then you know you have, you have arterial blood flow. Is that is that correct? Is that one way to kind of measure yeah. as a gauge of yeah. using this? Yeah, exactly. And that's, that's how we <clears> – <throat> so um, that's how we set the pressure because – there's two important kind of two big factors that determine um, how, how high the pressure should be. It's really dictated by how wide is the cup that you're using and then how big is the limb. Now, you can account for both of those if you take one single measurement where you do, you basically take whatever cup you're going to use, put it on whatever limb you're looking to exercise. And like you said, take the pulse distal to the cup. So like, in our lab, we put the cuff at the top of the arm. We're, we're placing a Doppler probe at the wrist or the ankle. And we slowly inflate the cuff until we get to the lowest pressure of which there is no flow. And then we take a percentage of that. And that's how we ensure that there's always blood flow going into the limb. Okay. And that's and then when you said low volume, so if I say if I include my upper arms and I'm going to do an upper body day, I should only do like one or two exercises, right? Like maybe a shoulder press or maybe some type of um, lateral raises and not really do a full workout wearing the, wearing the bands, correct? Or wearing the occlusion. Right. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and if you haven't done it at all, I would probably start with one exercise. 
Um, we, we've certainly done it where we've had people a long time ago, we went through total workouts with blood flow, under blood flow restriction, but I wouldn't recommend that if you have never done this before. I would do one exercise and then if you can work up to it, maybe two exercises. But beyond that, I mean, that, that muscle group is mostly going to be pretty much uh, maxed out for the day. Yeah, and, and the rep range that I've seen, and again, this is just from reading. I have a weird, funky visual memory, doctor. So when I read, when I when I read research, I take a lot of notes, and I'll remember what I write and 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 all that. But I remember seeing too that you have the width of the band that matches with pressure. You have um, the, the tourniquet applied. Oh, in the rep range. So the rep range that I saw in, in one or two studies was 30, 15, 15, 15. So one set of 30 and three sets of 15. So that's a relatively high volume. Is that is that pretty consistent with what your your findings have shown? Yeah, I think that's a, a pretty good one to use in, in actual practice. Um, in research, we started with that and used that for a long time, but we just transitioned to just saying, do as many repetitions as you can uh, for each set. So another way you can do it is just to go to uh, failure. Um, but I, I think when you're training people in real life, it, it, it probably it probably benefits to have some sort of goal goal repetitions so they know kind of what to shoot for. So I think both strategies are fine, or, or even doing both, I think is useful. Okay, and then real quick on this thread, it's relatively safe, right? I mean, again, the the perception when you start hearing blood flow occlusion, I know that it's like that. Like I said originally when I heard it, I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. And then you kind of have the same thing. But the research that I read. There were one or two. There were only like the the, the the number of incidents was very very low, considering the high number of people that the different research reviews read. All the different people that experienced it. Has that been your experience as well? That's a relatively safe procedure when applied correctly. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know, like we said a little bit earlier, there's you know you have to consider the two points. One, uh, it's only partial restriction, and two, it's very acute, so it's applied for only minutes, not for a not for long periods of time. Um, but yeah, and I, I think the, the one thing we always have to keep in mind is, is that anytime we're exercising, there's always a risk uh, for lots of different things to happen. I, I think the important question, um, and I think it's what you're getting at, that when we exercise with blood flow restriction, are we increasing that risk? Um, and when we look at two of the things that people are most concerned about, which is uh, coagulation activity or blood clots and muscle damage, Neither one of those um, seems to be an increased risk when we do it with blood flow restriction compared to that of traditional exercise. So, yeah, I would say that, uh, relatively speaking, it, it's pretty safe compared to normal exercise. So, uh, you know, it's funny how these things evolve. And I would say that BFR training is kind of an offshoot of uh, strength training for, uh, for pretty much everybody. And one of the big advantages is that we use relatively light weights. So if standard lifting for hypertrophy, you're going for 70 to 80% of one rep max. And, you know, let's say uh, three sets of six lifts or whatever. Um, what we do with uh, BFR training, it's more around 25 to 35% of one rep max. And it's usually three sets of 30 reps. And uh, that there's a number of things that happen with that. Uh, one is when we do it that way, we get a powerful fatigue signal. And we, we get it just so that, you know, the people fail in the last set. They just can't complete the 30 reps. And um, that failure signal is what prompts the adaptation. But because we've used light weights, uh, then there, you really don't get the muscle damage that you get when you're really lifting heavy. And also, you know, if you, if you end up, you actually can do more weight and more reps to failure because you're not sitting there wondering whether this 250 pounds you have over your head is, is going to fall on your foot or hurt your back or do something else. It's, you know, you're talking about having 50 pounds or 75 pounds over your head. So uh, that's no big deal to guide that bar down to, to where it's not going to hurt anything. And, um, so uh, this ends up being uh, a much more time efficient way of training uh, to get to that failure point or that fatigue point that you really need to do for your most intense workouts. 
and uh, it, it's, it's safer as well. And because the damage isn't done, you recover quicker. So instead of, you know, normally, at least our athletes, they put about 48 hours between uh, maximal lifting sessions for uh, one, uh, you know, let's say upper body or something. And uh, uh, here you can, instead of, you know, every two days, you can do two days, two, two, two workouts a day. And so it really, once you're doing that and recovering from it, then this building is accelerated and you just get a very uh, quick anabolic response. And I want to stay right now that we, we don't know. I always make this point, doctor, on, on the podcast is we don't know definitively how this works. We have an idea based on observation, but we can't really give any definitive answers because we don't clearly know exactly how the body responds to certain training variables. But when we look at blood flow restriction, it, the, the, the process of it restricts, what is it? Restricts venous flow out and maintains arterial flow in. Am I getting that right? It, let's talk a little bit about the process of what's happening with the blood when we do it, when we, when we use a blood yeah. pressure, we use BFR. It, and, and it is a little complicated, but I'll try to, I'll try to make it smooth. So when you first put on um, an elastic cuff or a rigid cuff, um, and you inflate it, uh, that, uh, the, the pressure in the, in the inflatable area actually uh, forces in on the uh, extremity. And our extremities are basically a hydraulic system. So it's, it's liquids and solids and stuff, and they don't move. The only thing that can kind of move out of the way. So if you if you're sitting there and you're you're squeezing a, an arm or something, the only thing that can get out of that space is blood, and it's at a lower pressure where you basically occlude the veins, than a higher pressure where if you kept kept on going, you would end up occluding the artery also. And but then after that, you're just increasing pressure in the extremity and nothing moves. I mean, maybe you squeeze a little water out, 